And it's Rob Garrison with Mercado Labs. Welcome to the third edition of First Things First. We introduce you to thought leaders from across the supply chain in industry, in media, and uh, supply chain uh, investing. So across those three areas. Last month's guest was Dave Anderson. Dave's the founder of Supply Chain Ventures, and we talked about where he sees supply chain technology headed and also some of the challenges ahead. So if you didn't catch that episode, I strongly encourage you to check that out. And um, Dave is widely considered to be the OG, original gangster of supply chain investing. So he shares lots and lots of wisdom. Today's guest is Julian Cunahan. Uh, Julian is the general partner of Schematic Ventures. And I guess Julian would be widely considered to be the NG or new gangster of supply chain investing. And I know you'll enjoy learning from Julian. So I look forward to that uh, segment. So we'll start in a few minutes. Uh, before we bring in Julian, I want to share a few headlines in a segment that I call uh, The Fastest Five. Also, a quick reminder that we support the Let's Talk Supply Chain Diversity Pledge. And I'm looking down because i got to read this name. Uh, each episode, we choose a participant to donate on their behalf. Last month's winner was Togai Somasun Duran. So, uh, so Togai, thank you very much for participating. And we look forward to donating a pledge to uh, diversity on your behalf. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, this month's episode is what I call Bulls and Bears. And so when I talk about bulls and bears, it's just a different way of managing supply chain, managing a supply chain. And I'll talk a little bit about the end, about the differences. But when you look back uh, for the last two years, everyone in supply chain has been managing in operating in what we would call a bull market. And that's, you know, just very simply where demand outpaces supply. And in this case, in every single area of the supply chain, demand outpaced supply. And so the, the challenge with that is you're having to talk to suppliers. Do they have enough supply of products? The transportation industry knows well that there wasn't enough supply of containers or vessel space. The people who are managing demand had to worry about getting product to customers every way possible because a lot of them were locked down or couldn't leave their homes. Super challenging time to find all that capacity when demand suddenly increases unexpectedly and you have a shortage of supply. For this MET segment, I want to sort of flip the script and talk about how we might need to adjust our supply chain strategy going forward for what I call a bear market. And a bear market simply is where the opposite happens, where supply outpaces demand. So I'm going to just read from a few articles to, to tell you why I think my conclusion about the fact that we might be entering a bear market exists. So the first one, I want to give a shout out to Gary Friedman. Um, uh, I'm sorry, Greg Miller. Greg Miller is from American Shipper, and his first article features Gary Friedman, who's the CEO of luxury brand Restoration Hardware, now known as RH. And Gary starts out with a scary, scary headline himself, where he calls this possibly the big short. And if anybody hasn't seen that movie, it's kind of talking about the real estate bubble and then the, and then the break. So hopefully it's nothing that dramatic, but that's how he refers to it. And the reason he refers to it that way is he's still dealing on the one hand with the bull market. He's still got orders that he placed four or five months ago that are coming in. And because the supply chain snafu is coming in late, at the, and that's on one hand. And on the other hand, he's starting to see a slowing in his demand. He saw in the third quarter that demand had dropped, or sorry, third, third month of the first quarter, that demand had dropped for the first two periods. And so he's, he's got increasing supply coming in and he's got potentially lower demand that creates this conundrum that he's referring to as the big short. So something to watch out for on that one. Um, another headline, and this one came from the Wall Street Journal article, shout out to Gwyn Guilford and Anthony DeBottos for this one. The headline reads, Fed's uh, a recession risk is rising, economists say. And the subtitle reads, uh, forecasters raise probability of economic contraction in the next 12 months to 28%. That's a huge number, so that's scary if accurate. So the article goes on to cite a bunch of other scary statistics, which I won't go through to back up that claim. However, the single biggest factor, of course, is inflation. And inflation is simply when things cost more, people buy less. And so if people buy less, then there's less demand. And so this whole thing that's been a bull market could turn into a bear market. Uh, the third article that I want to reference is an article by the Maritime Executive. No author cited, so no shot on this one. But the headline for this one reads, Container Ship Order Book its highest mark in since 2008. So here's, I'm gonna read you this quote. By their uh, calculation, the container ship order book has surpassed 6.5 million TEU, the highest in 15 years. So massive amount of capacity coming in. And importantly, this capacity we started to come in in 2002 and run through 2004. 
So this is what I mean about the potential of, uh, you know, the market changing. And all of a sudden we as supply chain professionals are dealing with a completely different situation where we're starting to manage container by container and having to call people at three o'clock in the morning to see if things are going to move to a situation where we're going to have to focus not on supply potentially, but on price. And it's a different kind of management challenge. They're both difficult. But when you're dealing with a, a recessionary type of situation in supply chain and there's less demand, the the pressures on your company's profit increase and therefore there's pressure on the supply chain to reduce costs. So we can go from basically bag borrowing and stealing to get containers and paying really massive uh, increases sort of at will to potentially now having to negotiate harder for everything, harder with the manufacturers for the cost of goods after two years of you know, begging them for supply harder with the carriers uh, all across all modes to get better prices and then harder with the parcel carriers for the delivery uh, because we've got to get a cost back down in line with potentially reduced profits. And so it's just a different kind of challenge. So I just uh, would love to hear your thoughts on that. And anyone out there who's got comments on that or anybody who's managed through a, a bear market or recessionary market would love to hear your comments. So uh, put your thoughts in the in the comment column or shoot me an email, uh, Rob Garrison, Mercado Lab, dot, dot, dot com, and I'd love to carry on that conversation. So with that, um, let's get ready to uh, welcome in our, our first guest, and that is Julian Cunahan. And there he is. Julian, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Rob. Yeah, it's great doing? to have you. I'm doing fantastic, and thanks for joining. So, uh, Julian, I, I think... Um, I described you in my intro as the NG or new gangster of the supply chain, because I don't think there's anybody that I've met in such a short time that almost everybody I talk to says, hey, do you know Julian Cunahan? So, so you kind of uh, quickly gained a great reputation in this business. And so maybe I'd like to start with uh, the question. Before we begin with the questions, can you give us the listeners uh, sort of your background in general? And then more specifically, how did you get started in supply chain investing? Sure. So I started as a software developer working on warehouse automation. Um, did that for a while and left for technology investment banking, spent five years there, and I've been investing in venture capital for about nine years now. So I made supply chain my focus very early on in my venture career. And so I've been working on this for quite a long time, uh, leaning on my background in networks in the category, uh, which led to launching Schematic Fund One in January of 2017. Okay, oh, great. So perfect background. Interesting that you went from coding to investing in technology. For sure, that's a, I, I don't hear that transition too often. So great background. Um, let me just start with the, the first question that I've got. Um, so looking back since you began investing when you started Fund One, uh, what's been the biggest change that you've seen in supply chain technology in the last few years? So when you look at your beginning to now, what kind of changes have you seen over that time? Well, I would say that um, capital has radically transformed the supply chain technology category. Uh, you're seeing way, way more venture-backed companies being started in supply chain today than you were when I started investing in 2017. One thing I like to highlight when comparing how far we've come, uh, an event I threw in 2016 had 10 really small companies, including Flex, Convoy, Emerge, Right Hand Robotics, and about seven of the 10 companies that were present in a small event that I threw in a tiny room at a Hyatt in Chicago <laughs> were uh, our unicorns now. Um, so wow, amazing. The category is just much, much bigger today. Uh, you have more investors focused on the area and you have more companies being started. So 10 years ago, who were starting supply chain technology companies, uh, I would say 100% industry practitioners. Today, you see folks entering the sector from other areas of technology who see opportunities and applications of technology that they've worked on elsewhere and applying that to the, to the industry. So... so yeah. Go ahead, John. Sorry. If I would sum it up, I would just say it's the industry has been radically transformed and is just so much, much bigger than it was 10 years ago. Yeah. And you mentioned uh, capital infusion as being sort of a root cause of that. What do you think is driving investors 
to increase these investments to the extent you're talking about in supply chain? What, what do you think is driving that decision to invest in supply chain versus any other industry or versus other industries? Uh, well, great question. Uh, there are a bunch of reasons. I think a lot of the credit comes or should go to some of the first movers in the category, the flex sports, the convoys who brought attention to how big and fast you could grow a company in this sector. Um, there was a lot of hesitation initially around the margins when investing into supply chain. And I think investors have subsequently learned that there are a lot of products that can be developed that are SaaS, truly high margin uh, subscription software products in the industry. So I'd say first movers and the massive success they've had. You've also got the growing of supply chain. I mean, supply chain is the backbone of the e-commerce industry. And um, with catalysts like COVID, it was really brought to the forefront. So a um, lot of reasons, but today where we're at, I would say uh, every large venture fund has a supply chain thesis. Whereas again, 10 years ago, uh, most funds wouldn't even touch the category. So let's talk about that for a minute. Um, what what would you consider to be your thesis? I'd like to learn more about sort of uh, your investment strategy. So what's your thesis? How do you determine where you want to invest? Uh, what segments or technology are you most excited about today? Sure. Well, you're going to love this. Um, <laughs> our thesis is we invest in great founders and entrepreneurs. And we're investing in Mercado, obviously. So we've got... <laughs> I'm um, blushing. Thank you. So we're less thesis driven uh, than I would say the average venture fund. Uh, we like to react to, again, great teams. If we meet a great team building a product in a super saturated category, we will still invest into that team. We do not feel that supply chain is a winner take all market and that we need to ride the waves of hype cycles. Uh, that being said, there are markets that we're seeing emerge in commercial viability. So last year we made two investments in the electrification of fleets, specifically around class two through class six vehicles that return to a depot every night. Uh, for class eight, we're more focused on the applications of hydrogen. So we made two investments in the electrification of fleets last year. And we did that because not we see a robust commercial market today but we see the electric fleet market coming into fruition in four to five years. So we're pre-seed investors. We invest $1 million into teams and ideas at the earliest stages, basically at the moment of company formation. And we're sort of looking at the company being a very large company about five years out. So electrification we think is still new, but by the time these companies grow into being very large companies, we think the market will be robust and established. Um, other trends, I would say something that's popped up in the past couple of months, which completely aligns with your comments um, earlier around the flipping of the supply chain category uh, from demand to supply and the changing of the sort of balance of strength in the equation. So it was all about capacity and assets over the past couple of years. And uh, you're seeing softening in the domestic freight market. You're seeing um, buildups in inventory. And I think this sort of changes the equation a little bit. So if we're investing in, let's say, domestic freight companies today, we want to invest in technology that will help either the carriers or the brokers be more competitive in a down market. So that's a sort of near term trend. Uh, one trend that I'll add as an investor that I'm watching very closely is uh, the reaction of the venture markets to rising rates. So it has been a just bananas boom market for the past three to five years. Never a better time to be a founder and never easier to raise large amounts of capital at great prices. With rising rates that we're starting to see this year, there is the possibility that that changes. So when I started in venture in 2014, uh, seed rounds were a million bucks, A rounds were 5 million, and uh, those were absolute sort of breakout financings. 
Last year, I would say a Series A, the Series A rounds that we saw in the portfolio range from 20 to 30 million. Um, so it's possible that with rising rates, um, the venture market starts to pull back to levels of maybe three to four years ago. We see round sizes shrink. We see it be more competitive to raise capital and the focus of investors moving from, okay, I'm going to finance you and we're going to sprint towards the next fundraise more so to, I'm going to finance you. Let's focus on a longer runway and more business building. Uh, interesting at a bunch of levels. Julian, I want to build, I'm going to back a lot of stuff, a lot of to unpack there, let's say. You talked about electrification. We had a comment from the audience from Alice Wang uh, said, interesting topic at that particular moment. Can you talk a little bit more about electrification and what that means to you? I don't know that everybody in the audience yeah. necessarily understands that terminology. So the electrification of fleets to us at Schematic is the adoption of electric vehicles in the let's say local delivery markets or regional delivery markets. So this could be a parcel van or a step van that you might see FedEx or UPS use, or it could be a larger box truck that perhaps XBO uses for local big and bulky delivery. So when we look at the electrification of fleets in that particular category, we see a lot of great trends, which we think make electric vehicles viable and both you know, both viable and preferable over combustion engine vehicles. So you've got returning to the depot every night. So shared charging infrastructure and the speed of charging is not a friction point uh, when the vehicle's not being used overnight. You have um, uh, better emission standards. You have government mandates as far as the percentage of vehicles in your fleet that must be electric by a certain date. California has them, a bunch of states have them. And then finally, you have a push from consumers who want uh, their supply chain partners and their delivery experience to be more sustainable. So all these together, we're seeing fleets really engage and evaluate how they're going to incorporate electric vehicles into their local fleets. And so when we're looking in our crystal ball, we see this market being a robust market in about four years. So right now, today, we're investing in really the picks and shovels around that trend. Is another factor, and maybe this ties into another point that you made in that uh, opening, is another factor labor? Uh, there's widely reported driver shortage in the marketplace. Does electrification help at all with that? Or is that an unrelated issue? Because now we're talking about autonomous vehicles. Are you looking at that as well? Uh, not... I have not invested in autonomous vehicles in the public environment because of the exogenous factors that are outside of the company's control. So there's one thesis we have here is if we invest into a great team and they do everything they had planned, but the market does not emerge or um, evolve and that demand never appears, um, that's just not, or if there's a factor that's outside their control that determines the fate of the company, that that is less of our strategy here. So with investing into autonomous public vehicles, you've got government regulations around safety, even if the vehicle is doing great when it is certified to carry serious freight on the open road, you've got um, uh, labor uh, issues. I mean, 3 million drivers in the United States um, carry the domestic freight sort of power that environment. So are you going to replace that? How will those unions react? And the constituents of various politicians react. So for all those exogenous factors, we haven't invested in autonomous vehicles in the public environment. It could be that we're absolutely wrong and it turns out to be a gangbuster environment for the class eights, but we have invested in autonomous vehicles, but in the private environment. So where a lot of these exogenous factors don't exist. So we've invested in one company, uh, it's called Outrider. It's an autonomous terminal truck that moves containers in yards. And in that particular environment, you can control all the factors that I mentioned might um, slow down the adoption of public autonomous vehicles. Interesting. All right. Thanks for that perspective. And then, so I want to go back to something else you said, where you talked about 
the gangbuster investments had largely been focused around capacity in that supply environment or demand environment and in the supply more about efficiency. Do you have any sort of additional thoughts on the type of investments you would make for efficiency versus for capacity? Can you give an example of that? Well, if you're a carrier in a down market, you're very focused on um, the assets that you own and yeah. util high utilization and um, and maintenance. So both the efficiency uh, utilization of the asset and the performance of that asset, the, the lifetime. So look, looking at the maintenance environment, uh, we think it's a great environment. And then we're looking at technology that ties volume to uh, that capacity. So as a carrier, how can you enter into guaranteed contracts that will provide guaranteed utilization of your asset throughout the year? So one great company to highlight here is Leaf Logistics. Uh, so Leaf with financial contracts will give you the ability to lock in volume uh, that meets the needs of your carrier fleet. So that's a great example of how we would invest into um, domestic freight around a down market. So maintenance and performance of the asset and then locking in and guaranteeing utilization of that asset. Julie, does your fund or your firm, I should say, think about the overall industry? You know, one of the things that I observe, I have observed over my time in this industry is just the general resistance to technology. As you know, probably better than anybody, it's been an industry that's relied for a long time on sort of traditional tools like Excel and email. Do you see that as a barrier to growth or do you see that that's changing in the external marketplace and more and more customers are recognizing maybe through this crisis or maybe otherwise that technology is going to be a component? I definitely think that's changing. And I think it's changing because of the generational shift that you're seeing in the supply chain industry. Um, folks with PL control buyers today are in their 30s and 40s and they grew up with an iPhone. Um, so they are starting to expect that uh, high end consumer UX UI in the products that they buy today. And uh, I think they're better buyers as well, less. Stakes in top golf, although that's always going to be part of the supply uh, chain industry. But um, let perhaps less stakes in top golf and more um, more SaaS software, more online cloud purchase of. I mean, when I started investing in this category, there was still a hesitance around cloud software inside the warehouse, and I think that mindset is, is today in 2022 almost completely gone. The idea it, of on-prem software is, um, yeah, it's it's not something I've heard of recently. Okay, great. And so, just a quick note: I'm going to short my stake in Top Golf socks. Uh, <laughs> I love Top Golf. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I do too. I do too. I just a real quick, uh, gentlemen, I give a shout out to uh, Samuel Escala Osa. He's tuning in all the way from Panama. So shout out to Samuel. Um, I've got a question here, Julian, for you from Sarah Barnes Humphrey talking about predictive capacity on international freight rather than um, quoting then finding capacity would be a game changer. So do you think at all about the, some of the technologies that we've seen emerge that are using, um, you know, call it machine learning and then artificial in in intelligence to be uh, more thoughtful because they've got all the computer capacity about predicting where capacity will be available? Is that something you get involved with? Well, uh, from an international perspective, I would say the liners are, are very good at their business, uh, very sophisticated companies. So when they're predicting um, macroeconomic events that will change volume and trade lanes, I would say they're, they're pretty good at that. I would say for the for retailer or SMB, the idea of predicting upstream capacity or uh, changes in uh, trade partners, there's sort of a, a step before that. I don't think we're at predictive yet. I don't think we have the data or connectivity where predictive makes sense. I think, you know, and this is something great that Mercado is working on is connectivity is the first step to 
Do you want to take that? <laughs> uh, just my alarm. Let me know. Uh, <laughs> this time flew by. No, sorry, Julian. This time flew um, by. I wasn't even paying attention to the clock. So, please so I think you know it's companies like Mercado that are creating the connections, which are necessary as the foundation to then apply uh, predictivity and you know predictivity in in domestic supply chain categories absolutely crucial. Got a lot of companies working on this. Cognops is, is applying that inside um, the warehouse. Um, but when it comes to international, I think first you just need that foundation of, of connectivity. And that's companies like Mercado that are connecting upstream partners with domestic partners. And it's first that piping before you can get to the sophisticated, you know, let's forecast the future. Okay, I've got one more for you, Julian. We've run a bit over, but um, Jay Harmon said, digitization is the future of supply chain space. Uh, I guess the, his question is, do you agree, Julian, and does the audience agree? Uh, any doubt in your mind, Julian, that digitization is the way we're going to go forward? I, I guess if I didn't agree, I would be saying that paper and, <laughs> <laughs> paper and pencil... Are and you get out of the, and you get out of supply chain tech investing <laughs> business on top of it, yeah. <laughs> so I think, I, think I, I obviously agree. Digitization is is the future. Um, you know, the one <laughs> twist I'll, I'll put on that is sometimes it seems obvious that digitization is the future, and you you brought up uh, the reliance on Excel and and sort of um, more rudimentary tools, but the friction that you see. No one today doesn't want software. They just want the right software. They don't want too much software and they want full connectivity. So if you see any hesitation around uh, software adoption, usually it's, it's not because anyone doesn't like software. It's because of the burdens about purchasing the wrong software do exist and are well known. Sure. So, yep, I'm, we're pretty much all in on digitization. <laughs> Sure. Pro digitization, yeah. And let's just yeah. hope all, all the everybody gets gets online. Uh, managing it yep. with uh, 1985 technology is not the way to go. So, right. Julian, thank you very much for your time. As always, I enjoyed it. And uh, again, sorry for the alarm; it flew by. I didn't even catch it. But I uh, hope you have a great afternoon. And thanks for joining. Great. Thanks, Rob. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Okay, so that was Julian Cunahan, and now hopefully everybody knows why I enjoy talking to Julian uh, so much. Very thoughtful. And just a, a funny side note, I met Julian um, at a conference, and I kind of fanboyed him a little bit, to be honest with you, and been a great relationship ever since. So thanks to Julian. Um, I, I want to just end this with my closing thoughts, and uh, I'm going to read from this a little bit because it's uh, sort of hot off the press. Yesterday I was talking to a guy by the name of Mike Royster. And Mike currently works for Tompkins Ventures. And if you don't know who that is, please check them out. Really interesting firm uh, created by Jim Tompkins, a uh, long time in the consulting business. And now they're doing some really interesting things, um, innovations in the space. But this story was about when Mike used to be the head of uh, international logistics and supply chain for Ingersoll Rand. And we were talking about what is going on in the industry overall. And he had an interesting quote. And he said, you know, the thing that frustrated him the most about the international supply chain is that there's never one truth. And I wrote that down because I never thought about it that way. I've heard all kinds of variations of, you know, one, one version of the truth and single source of truth and all that stuff. But his point was that there's never one version of the truth. And so I just want to sort of leave on that note is to me, that's the biggest reason for digitization so that we've got one version of the truth. In the international supply chain, the sourcing people have one version and they talk in a certain language about supplier capabilities and capacity and how they select them. Purchasing people have yet a second, logistics people have yet a third, and then the demand side of the business has yet a fourth and none of those things are connected. And so when you think about the complexity of this business, all the different entities, all the different people, all the time that it takes to get the supply chain together, uh, we've never really been um, more in need of always one truth versus never one truth. So that's my closing thought for the day. Uh, please, as always, uh, you know, we, we uh, love to have you here, love to have you for the next show, and we really appreciate your participation. And again, if you've got any questions, drop me an email, drop me a line, and hope you all have a great day. Thank you very much.